Hello, everyone. Welcome to the University of Toronto Joint Center for Bioethics Seminar Series. I'm Andrea Bianchi, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Our speaker today is Jordan Joseph Wadden, and his seminar is entitled Advanced Artificial Intelligence and Healthcare. Is consent, is consent really in jeopardy? Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to let you know that the seminar is being recorded. This lecture, along with other archive lectures, can be accessed through the Joint Center for Bioethics website. The format of our seminar is a presentation by our speaker, followed by a facilitated discussion period. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Jordan Joseph Wadden is the full-time bioethicist at Ontario Shores Centre for Mental Health Sciences. His research portfolio focuses on biomedical ethics, AI ethics, and the philosophy of biotechnology. His doctoral dissertation focuses on what types, type or types of AI we should want for healthcare, what a clinician's obligations are to their patients when using advanced AI, and whether it is possible to consent to a machine. He has ongoing projects beyond this, including a Canada-wide project on the ethics of the language used to discuss medical assistance in dying and severe disability, as well as a BC-based project in ethics and pediatric organ transplantation. Now, I'll turn it over to you, Jordan. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm super excited to talk to you today, um, just because AI is advancing so quickly and one of the biggest target audiences, biggest targets for new technology is the healthcare sector. Um, so I am academically trained as a philosopher, but I'm also, uh, as Andrea mentioned, working as a bioethicist in Ontario Shores. I also did a fellowship training back in British Columbia um, with the Provincial Health Service Authority and with uh, Providence Healthcare. So I've, I'm, this presentation today merges both my theoretical as well as my on the ground kind of considerations. And before I get started, uh, it's really important to clarify what I mean by advanced AI. So much of this technological development in healthcare AI and machine learning is aimed at reducing a clinician's workload um, with the patient data so that they can then reinvest that time to patient facing care and patient discussions to build that therapeutic relationship. So my focus today is going to be explicitly and only on those proposals that aim to take over decision-making in diagnostics, therefore allowing clinicians to spend time with their patients rather than pouring over lab results, MRI scans, or things along those lines. So I have a few goals for today that if I am successful, uh, you will walk away with. So the first is to just start learning about how AI ethics interacts with healthcare and how it is already being used in healthcare. The second is to have you start to challenge your understanding of consent, especially as it relates to informed consent as a technical term um, that might go beyond your current understanding of consent. And then the real reason why you're here is to examine two arguments against AI systems uh, on the basis that they jeopardize consent. And I'm gonna show why we don't have to worry about those arguments. So the outline is basically doing those goals in order. I'm gonna give you a primer for AI. Um, now I do wanna flag anyone who knows anything about AI um, already might find my primer a little reductive. I apologize in advance for that, but I do just want to ensure everyone is on the same generalist level rather than going into the technical details. Um, and then we're gonna go on to informed consent, what I call the understanding objection and what I call the personhood objection. Now I wanna highlight from the outset that I am explicitly focusing on a very small consideration of the larger question of advanced AI in healthcare. So I'm only focusing on the informed consent piece, but please note that I am not talking about things like bias, medical racism, disability justice, 
the privacy of data or ethical training of algorithms. This project that I'm working on is just one part of a larger project that we as a community have to take on. And I don't try to pretend that I've solved everything just by getting to my answer at the end of this talk. In fact, that would be uh, inappropriate for me to do so. So with that little disclaimer said, let's get to the artificial intelligence. So there is a growing excitement with the idea of implementing AI in healthcare, especially in the decision-making and diagnostic fields. And this is because at least initially, it appears AI is going to be able to outperform human clinicians uh, in both speed and accuracy. So for example, there was a study done by McKinney and colleagues uh, published back in 2020, uh, January of 2020, it was very early in the year. Um, and it was from Google, it demonstrated that their AI system they were working with outperformed six doctors in predicting breast cancer, um, uh, uh, just results from the, from the scans. It also showed that it could reduce the workload of a second reader. So that person who verifies the first clinician's work, it reduced that workload by 88%. So if this performance is indicative of AI's potential in healthcare, widespread application could drastically change diagnostics and decision-making in a positive way. Now, there is no uniform definition that everyone reliably agrees on when we're talking about artificial intelligence. But there are generally two or three high-level distinctions, depending on who you ask. And some of you who already know AI might look at my list and say, why are there three and why is general in the middle? I'll get there. Um, but I prefer this, um, this three-part definition because it gives a little bit more nuance. Um, it gives a little more um, finer tooth, finer grained uh, understanding of the AI uh, that are out there today. So for the three level distinction that I'm going to be employing here, the first are generally just reactive systems. They're built for a specific purpose. Uh, they do a specific thing and they're often called narrow or sometimes weak AI. So some examples of this, uh, those of you who work in healthcare, you might know of HARP, which is harmonic phase algorithm. Um, th that's a medical imaging analysis technique that's used to extract pro and, and process motion information from tagged MRIs. Um, those of you who are not in healthcare might instead recognize something like Stockfish, which is a chess playing algorithm that was used in the early days of chess algorithms, which have now gotten pretty intense and we're not going to go there. They're, they're pretty intense now. Um, the second set of systems are general systems. And those who work on the two tiered system will be like, oh, general, no, that's, that's those that are like sci-fi. Well, on the three uh, definition, general systems are just those that are able to train on data sets and learn on their own, sometimes called unsupervised learning. So for example, IBM's Watson, which many of us know for its stint on Jeopardy, would be one of these. Um, what many of us might not know is that Watson is being used in medical settings in the United States. Uh, and that's because it can handle and learn from various fields by training on various data sets. It's not just a trivia machine. The final kind of uh, artificial intelligence is artificial general intelligence or strong AI. And these are currently entirely theoretical. These are systems that replicate autonomous human intelligence or go beyond human intelligence. So you can think of things like HAL, which was the rogue computer assistant from 2001 a Space Odyssey. You can think of Terminators, things along those lines. For this talk today, I'm specifically discussing general AI, those that can learn from data sets but are not yet Terminators. Now, within general AI, there's two primary ways of classifying the types of uh, systems you'll encounter. And those are gonna be the black box, which you see at the top here with my cursor, and then the explainable AI systems or sometimes called white boxes that you see at the bottom here with my cursor. Black boxes are those systems where you only know the input output relationship. Sure, someone designed them and they knew what they were like when they were designed, but they don't give you information on how they're learning, on what nodes they're developing as they are training on various data sets. So you don't really know why the input leads to an output. You just know that it's reliable. 
Explainable AI or the white boxes are systems that you can clearly explain how they behave, how they produce predictions, uh, what influencing variables contributed to what and how. Um, sometimes people view them as less accurate or view them as only able to predict rather than discover. That's not always true. And as we develop stronger and stronger systems, it doesn't always have to be the case. Um, but it's sometimes something that gets lodged against white box systems in favor of black box systems. Now, with those two things said, there's something here in the middle. There's a third option that's not often discussed, and it's called gray box systems. One way to define a gray box, as presented by Christensen and Lyons back in uh, 2017, is as a system that provides sufficient information about the learning technology to establish trust, where much like humans, uh, we base that trust on a synthesis of predictability, feasibility, uh, inference of intent of one's knowledge, of goals, of values. Basically, they're saying a gray box system is kind of like a human. You don't know everything that's going on in there, but you can understand enough to work with what it's saying and to understand its justification. The introduction of these gray boxes transforms the discussion from a dichotomy, black, white, into a spectrum of transparency and explainability. And that's because proposals for partially transparent or partially explainable um, boxes, for lack of a better word, aren't going to be consistent. They're not going to be uniform. There might be a gray box system that is dark gray because it is more opaque than other gray box systems. There might be a gray box system that is light gray because it is more transparent. You can see more of what's going on. The big goal here should be discussing and promoting algorithms um, on this spectrum so that we can actually place and identify what is necessary to make this a safe system and what we don't actually need to know. Um, so in a kind of roundabout way throughout this presentation, I'm also arguing that the system should be this gray box uh, setting. Now, the last thing on this kind of AI primer is just how does AI interact with healthcare? Um, so a recent study in the United Kingdom by Fennec and colleagues in 2018 reported from the general adult population that 55% of people were uncomfortable with AI performing diagnostics. A big problem, given that that is one of the main areas that we're hoping AI will take in. They also saw that 63% were uncomfortable with AI performing the duties of doctors, uh, such as answering medical questions, and 49% said they were uncomfortable with their medical data being used to train algorithms, which will be required to make sure that the system is kept up to date with the population. Um, now, there was another study, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm blanking on whose study it was. If I remember, maybe I can post it in the YouTube comments. Um, but this other study was focused on radiology students, so on future professionals who would be most likely using the system since radiology is um, kind of seen as a prime candidate to first uh, introduce these systems because it's easier to quantify their data um, or their images. So from this, 83% said that they had positive opinions of AI in general, 77% thought that it would revolutionize their field, while 86% said maybe not revolutionize, but it would definitely improve. Um, and 71% said that hey, all medical training should include AI with the way that AI is developing. Interesting though, 56% said that they still believe that AI could not return a definite diagnosis. So again, we're getting at that issue where one of the main reasons why we would want this kind of systems, why we're building these kinds of systems, even the professionals aren't sure if this is going to be possible. So that's a bit of background on AI. Again, for anyone who already knows AI, very cursory, I apologize. Um, but now let's move on to um, the other part of setting up this problem before we get into the two objections I wanna see, and that's um, consent. So one of the biggest problems with the proposed expansion and application of AI in healthcare settings is that this informed consent is gonna be jeopardized at best or entirely destroyed at worst by the use of these systems. Um, because the view is that when it comes to consent, it should be the human clinician doing the consent process, being the one who is consented to, rather than a machine running some diagnostic that the human then uses. It's not 
um, like a tool that the, the clinician might currently have available with current AI technology um, that gives them options and then they use their clinical judgment, these systems are built to do that deciding for the, the clinician and then the clinician just runs with it. Um, so that might cause some problems. The most common way this is expressed is by challenging whether a patient can ever understand enough about a system uh, to provide consent. You can see this in uh, writers like Watson and colleagues back in 2019. Um, there's also concerns whether it would render consent impossible ethically from Schiff and Borenstein 2019 or uh, Cohen 2020 considers this question from the legal standpoint. Um, so before moving on to these concerns, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page with what exactly is this consent that they're talking about? So informed consent, from a general perspective, when the average person thinks of it, you're typically thinking something along the lines of FRIES, uh, which is employed by places like Planned Parenthood. So FRIES stands for freely given, reversible, informed, enthusiastic, and specific, F-R-I-E-S. Sometimes the general conception of consent, though, is even simpler than that. Um, something just like an enthusiastic yes that we tend to hear in, in uh, social media. Or sometimes it's even just thought of as a positive expression to, consent, to continue. So it's not even that enthusiastic part. From a healthcare perspective, though, the most canonical understanding is that it's a combination of seven capabilities. Competence, voluntariness, disclosure, recommendation of a plan, understanding of that plan, uh, expression of a decision, and authorization to carry out that plan. And this all comes from Beecham and Childress. These can be grouped into three different categories that build off each other. And importantly, these represent the theoretical underpinnings of consent and not the legal understanding. So I'm not talking about what consent means in Ontario, where I'm currently based, or what consent means in BC, where I did my training. This is the theoretical view of consent, which then gets um, bolstered by the law of wherever you are. So these three categories, competence and voluntariness, they're gonna be the thresholds or preconditions for consent to occur. So voluntariness, simplest of the two criteria, it just refers to whether or not the patient or client chooses to engage in decision-making of their own volition, free from undue coercion or influence, it's simple as that. It gets a little more complicated in practicality, but again, we're going theoretical. Competence is going to be the more complicated of the two. At its simplest, competence refers to the ability to perform some task. In healthcare, the ability to perform the task of consenting. But a patient's competence can vary over time or it can vary in between decisions. You can be capable to your healthcare, but not capable to your finances. It's, it gets messy. Um, if a patient doesn't have capacity, then, or if they're unconscious, or if they're having significant delusions in this particular moment in time, in this one little break from their normal, we can turn to things like substitute decision making or shared decision making. Um, we can also use coherence with historical values to ensure that a patient is deciding in line with their true self, which, while that idea is not problem free, it still helps protect some patients who have wavering competence. So that competence piece gets really messy really fast. Um, the next category, disclosure of information, recommendation of a plan and understanding of that plan. Um, these are what form the informational components uh, category. The purpose here is to make sure that the basis on which consent can be performed is actually put in place. Recommendation of a plan is going to be collaborative between the patient or client and the healthcare professional, and it's relatively straightforward. You're just collaborating, trying to come up with a plan. The criteria that takes the most time to understand is that disclosure piece itself. Um, and this is typically associated with the healthcare professional's duty to inform the patient of risks, benefits, harms, options, um, et cetera, that are going to be involved in their diagnosis, treatment, or procedure, whatever it is that they're going through. Um, this duty itself can be split into five different categories. Um, those facts that the patient considers material to deciding. Um, so in the AI case, maybe the mere fact that AI is being used might be material for a patient. Um, those facts that the professional believes to be material. The professional's recommendations themselves. 
the purpose of seeking consent in the first place, and then the nature and limitations of consent for the specific patient situation. Those five pieces need to be there for that, uh, for that, cap, that, um, that piece to be in play. And then finally, we have the expression of a decision and authorization of that decision, which form the actual consenting category, the actual elements of consent. Um, so that is just, that is the one part that is squarely in the patient or client's control. At this point, the healthcare care practitioner has done everything they can to give full information and be collaborative, and it is squarely within the patient to decide. And that means at this point, we're no longer considering what a reasonable patient would want or whether this patient has capacity because those assessments have already been done. All right, we've got the primer, we've got the consent primer. Let's get into the reason you all came today. One of the biggest areas, as I said earlier, is the possibility that consent is at risk when we introduce AI to decision-making um, in healthcare. We've seen that concern pop up, as I mentioned earlier with Watson, Schiff and Borenstein, uh, authors along those lines. Um, but we can also recognize intuitively that it just feels weird to say that you're going to consent to a machine. It just, it, it feels weird. So we need to take it as a serious concern. So what I've done with my understanding objection and my personhood objection, as we will see them in a minute, is I've synthesized the various positions, feelings, offhanded remarks that I've heard at conferences and other conversations that are going on, both online and offline in the AI ethics literature, and I've put them into these two objections, the understanding objection and the personhood objection. So the first one, the understanding objection, the argument basically goes, and for uh, any logicians or epistemologists in the crowd, I apologize that this is not perfect logic. Um, perfect logic would have been a little too P and q -y for me, so I just made it a little more prosaic, a little more literary. Um, so the argument is informed consent requires understanding, seems to make sense. Feasible healthcare AI isn't appropriately understandable. Okay, we'll have to explain that a little bit. But those two things together mean that AI jeopardizes consent. So the questions of whether informed consent is even possible without some grasp of the system reaching its conclusion is what this one is trying to uh, capture. The motivation for it seems to lie in the concern that without the knowledge that, of, of what the system has used and how it has come up with its decision, um, patients just can't meet the criteria for uninfluenced and fully informed consent. It just, we break down those, those capabilities. Um, some uh, think that this is going to be more of a concern for black boxes or those darker gray boxes, but there are also individuals like Alex John London back in 2019 who argue that, well, we might have some issues with black boxes, but white boxes, and by extension, the light gray boxes that I've introduced, just aren't possible in healthcare, they're too burdensome. So we need to rule those out for practical limitations and oh, now we're only left with black boxes which have the consent issue. So now we need to get rid of all AI because all AI is going to jeopardize healthcare. And this mirrors sentiments that are in other fields too. Um, so for example, Hillman in 2019 and Howe in 2019, both in the legal field, um, one of whom I believe it's Hillman who is a judge, um, they both argue that if an individual receives a longer prison sentence due to an algorithm that tests the likelihood that that person will reoffend, then it's at least plausible we have a moral obligation to explain to that individual why the algorithm produced its verdict. If we can't understand the AI's reasoning in these cases, we cannot justify its use in the legal system from a moral standing. The same would go in this case. If we can't understand the AI's reasoning for recommending a diagnosis or, um, or a decision, we can't morally uh, allow it to happen. I think there are two different ways we can respond to this one um, that I think both are successful at defeating it. So the first way is to challenge this argument by saying that the first premise is intentionally vague and therefore misrepresents understanding. That is to say, 
while informed consent does require understanding, it doesn't require the kind of understanding that's currently being discussed in the literature. So for an example, taking it out of the medical field, sorry, out of the AI field, keeping it in the medical field, uh, when a patient is told they need a blood test, uh, we don't require that the patient understands how the various blood tests work. They aren't required to understand what proteins are gonna be examined or why the presence of one marker indicates condition A or B. They just need to understand the general facts, safety, efficacy, and what the blood test means for their healthcare going forward, for their goals going forward, uh, when it returns suggestions on what is wrong. So for AI systems, maybe appropriate understanding isn't going to be understanding the intricacies of the system. Instead, it might just be understanding how the system impacts their health goals, their outcomes, other relevant considerations like risk, how and whether racial data is used in developing a decision, things along those lines. Now, currently the problem with this suggestion is that we don't have data on what the average patient would want or need to know because these systems aren't widespread. But if we look back to surveys like the two I cited earlier in the presentation, we can start to get an idea of what the average patient would be worried about. And this helps identify areas of AI use that we would need to be able to explain to an understandable level. Uh, so from a theoretical informed consent standpoint, the understanding argument could be successfully defeated in this way. We just need to work on the practical elements now. So it's not inherently a problem. We just don't have the studies figuring out what patients would actually care about learning. Relatively simple fix. I mean, time consuming, but relatively simple in the, in the um, grand scheme of things. That might not be satisfactory to some people who still hold this understanding objection. <clears throat> So another way to challenge this is to say that the second premise is wrong. This could be true, like just flat out wrong. Uh, and that is the feasible AI in healthcare. Um, how, how did I phrase this? Feasible healthcare AI isn't appropriately understandable. So we can just say that that's flat out wrong. Um, so what we could do uh, is we could say that, okay, Opaque systems are inappropriate for healthcare. Transparent systems are gonna be more appropriate. That's a quick, simple fix, we're done. But if we pull back to Alex John London and the feasibility, and we're really focusing on that feasible healthcare AI part of that premise, we need to say a little bit more than that quick response to actually dismiss this. So I think a better way to address this, this problem and reject this objection is to recognize that there's more than one way that something can be opaque, more than one way that something can fit into that kind of problematic, quote unquote, scare quotes, black box or dark gray box category. If we're going to go the route of saying that white boxes are um, too burdensome, which that's another discussion and I don't think they are, but pretend that we're going along that route and we're just focusing on the others now. Um, something can be opaque essentially, meaning that it's just inherently unknowable, no one can understand it, but something can also just be presently opaque, which means that it's opaque to a person due to their practical limitations. So maybe a system is opaque to the patient, but it's not opaque to their clinician, and their clinician can then use their own understanding to help the patient understand, and we bridge the gap in that sense. So another way to think about this is to say that appropriate understanding doesn't mean full technical details. We saw that in the first response. Um, so this is just another way of recognizing already existing levels of understanding and identifying which one actually matters and relates to patient needs. To go back to the blood test example, um, if you started explaining to a patient the technical side of the tests that they're about to undergo, you're likely going to be met with blank stares. Um, they're probably not going to understand anything. Some might, but most won't. And that's because the technical side takes years of education and then training to actually master and understand. So if we put that into the AI situation, 
if you went into a meeting with an average patient and started talking about, oh, the depth of your trees in the random forest classifier, or which data the system considers to be numerical, binary, or categorical, you're going to run into issues with understanding. But that's not because there's a problem with the system. That's because there's a problem of what level of understanding you're actually looking for. So um, if you go into that same meeting with your own understanding as a clinician, explainable to you, understandable to you, and then you give that to the patient, you translate it to the patient, the patient can get an appropriate understanding from your explanations rather than trying to make them understand the AI directly, which means we can make an ethical argument against consent being in jeopardy from an understanding standpoint on this response as well. So neither of the first two premises work. The last one is just a conclusion, it's not a premise. So from an understanding perspective, the most commonly cited reason for concern, consent's not in jeopardy at all. It's not in jeopardy just because we're using advanced AI systems. So let's move on. Here's where things are about to get weird. And I hope that you don't mind indulging me on a little bit of sci-fi, um, mainly because I think given the way that the literature is going, it's not so much sci-fi as a legitimate question that we're trying to get an answer to. So the second argument is grounded in current AI ethics debates. It considers that consent might be in jeopardy depending on how we use or view the AI in a care setting. So if we compare AI to other tools at the disposal of the healthcare professional, it's gonna be difficult to argue that a failure to disclose uh, reliance on AI is violating any form of informed consent. We don't disclose things like the size of our scalpels or the size of the mask that we're putting on them for anesthetic. But if we start to see the AI as a person, stay with me, if we start to see the AI as a person, we might run into some difficult questions and difficult uh, problems for the encounter. So consent here could be challenged using this debate by appealing to various moves in AI rights and the philosophy of mind. There is a view that if a system is complex enough, and there's another view that if a system is functionally similar enough, both of these to a human, then it might need to be considered to be a mind. These views then imply that a person system might deserve rights and responsibilities, including responsibilities to others. And to just rattle off a few names in this debate, there's Kokelberg from 2010, there's Sharkey from 2017, there's DePaolo from 2019. This is a serious consideration that's going on in the literature. Now, debates on robot personhood and robot rights range from thinking robots need to have rights and status all the way to Johanna Bryson's firm statements in 2010 that robots, quote, should be slaves. Um, terrible choice of word. She defends it in a, I think, not so great way. I wish she had chosen a different word, but her argument is pretty sound. It's pretty strong, but it's also a decent argument. Um, now, there are others in this debate that say that even discussing robot rights fundamentally focuses on the wrong problem. And in that regard, I'm thinking of people like Abeba Berhain, um, uh, who wrote a paper on this kind of topic with, uh, so it was Berhain and Vendik uh, 2020, if you wanna look that one up. Um, and it's just about focusing on the wrong problem if you're talking about robot rights. So I say all this, but the important thing for today is not whether we can prove advanced AI will have personhood. I'm entirely agnostic on that question. I'm not in that literature um, as an active researcher. I just know that literature exists and have read it. So instead, what's important for today is just considering the significant discussions that are going on about personhood already, we ought to consider this a live possibility until proven and otherwise. So um, the reason that these person systems that are conceptually possible um, could cause problems is due to the fact that it would be making a significant portion of the diagnostic and decision-making. And this would make the person system analogous to something like ghost surgery or concurrent surgery, which Cohen 2020 outlines. Um, so a ghost surgery is when a single specialist receives consent from a patient to do their surgery. 
but has another clinician finish the surgery for them after they've done the messy bits. Um, whereas a concurrent surgery is when a single clinician works on more than one patient at the same time and kind of is going in and out of the rooms while other people pick up when they're gone. Now, these could be useful tactics, um, especially in like training hospitals, but these situations can violate consent when that informed consent is conditioned upon the individual clinician performing the operation. So if the patient said, I'm consenting, but only to you, or I'm consenting, assuming it's only going to be you because you haven't told me that there's going to be someone else involved in the major aspects, that could violate consent. Applying that back to AI, if informed consent is conditioned on the assumption that a human doctor is running diagnostics, then an advanced AI diagnostic system could violate this condition. So let's respond to this. In the same way, I have two responses. The first way is just to simply say AI is not a person. It will never be a person. Um, it falls in line with people like Johanna Bryson who say it's just a tool. That's fine, but even staunch critics like Bryson, who say robots should quote unquote be slaves, don't, if you look at their arguments, it doesn't seem like they actually think advanced systems are fundamentally incapable of personhood. Instead, Bryson herself will set out various obligations that designers have to ensure that robots remain subservient. Things like making sure that the body is utterly replaceable or ensuring that there's no stationary brain in the unit and that it's instead stored in the cloud. Things that would remove it from being able to be human-like. Now, if we were to limit it in these ways, um, that means that in order to protect informed consent, we need to fundamentally limit ourselves when designing AI systems. These advanced systems, I should say. But that's a significant drawback because authors like Eric Topol in 2019 indicate that much of the industry wants to move towards Watson-like systems in healthcare applications, which as we improve upon Watson-like systems and make them stronger and stronger, could risk personhood based off of the personhood and robot rights arguments. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, so unfortunately, I think this part of the objection is actually sound. I don't, I don't have an, a position. I am agnostic on whether or not personhood is a thing, but if we follow the arguments for the sake of, of today, I don't think we can dismiss this first part. I think AI could be a person. We need to iron it out, but I think it could happen. So that means we need to challenge the other premise. Otherwise we have to say, well, the sci-fi version does successfully jeopardize consent. Before we give up hope on that, I do have that second uh, response in my back pocket. This one says, look, let's pretend that yes, AI is going to be a person. This doesn't mean that they're any different from um, a secondary person on the healthcare team, like an assisting nurse, an anesthesiologist, things along those lines. They're not the primary person operating, but there's someone in the room. And we already have some ones in the room all the time. So this would be no different than say, if Dr. Abanda was the primary surgeon, the consented to surgeon, and Dr. Da Silva was assisting. In this case, with AI as a person, Dr. Abanda would instead be assisted by Dr. AI. To be successful with this response though, I need to address the potential connection to ghost and concurrent surgeries that I mentioned earlier. Um, one that is particularly uh, relevant is in 1996, a court case was heard in Pennsylvania where one surgeon consented a patient, a patient, but another surgeon had performed the surgery resulting in complications. Now, because of these complications, the patient came forward in the legal battle stating that he would not have given consent had he known the first surgeon was not gonna be the one to complete it himself. Legal considerations aside, because I'm not a lawyer, the ethical argument here comes from this analogy uh, comes in that the patient would not have provided consent had full information, the fully informed part of informed consent um, been actually given. So um, if a physician performs a procedure herself, but the actions are based on what the AI recommended for the patient, 
without the patient knowing the AI was the one doing the recommending, then that patient might have a similar ethical and perhaps legal case against the hospital. Out of all the challenges, this one is the most sci-fi, but I also think it's the hardest one to dismiss right away. And that's because the ideal future use of AI is to do exactly what's deemed problematic in the case, make decisions the professionals can use so that they have time to work with and spend time developing therapeutic relationships with the patients. To get around this and to actually address this, I think this is where some degree of explainability and understandability, um, at least for the clinician, can come back and help us. If a professional can explain the justification for the system, then it doesn't, as we saw earlier, it doesn't matter if the patient understands the system, the professional can be the one to explain it and then that understanding can be translated in that sense. But there's another way to, to reach this explainability. And again, we're going a little sci-fi here. I think, and I wanna make a bold claim when I do this, I think that any AI system that reaches personhood as described in the AI rights literature right now is going to be a gray box system, is going to be like a person, literally as is, is being argued. So our current assistants, our medical students, our colleagues, they're not fully or even robustly transparent to us. They're not white boxes, but they're also not black boxes because we can interact with them. So there is no way for a primary clinician to know the inner workings of their medical students, of their colleagues, but we still trust them. It's going back to that definition of a gray box from uh, Christensen and Lyons. We understand enough to be able to work with. And I think any system that gets to this point, if a system ever gets to this point, will be able to provide enough justification to allow trust and relationships. Um, so with all this said, I think the personhood argument can be dismissed by the second, the second response. That means that both the commonly cited, the understanding argument, and the sci-fi, the personhood argument, both of them show that consent isn't definitively jeopardized simply because an advanced AI system was involved. All right, so I'm going to wrap up so that there's time for questions. So that was a lot. I hit you with a lot of things. So to sum up, AI does not always mean consent is in jeopardy. Implementation of AI needs to be careful, especially regarding ensuring patients understanding. Um, Without this, consent is in jeopardy. From an understanding standpoint, three, um, our focus needs to be on achieving the correct level of understanding and refining what understanding means rather than just saying understanding doesn't exist. And four, from the personhood standpoint, our focus needs to be on if we ever get to robots that have personhood, which again, agnostic for the purposes of today's talk, if we ever get here, our focus needs to be on creating physician assistance, not physician alternates. Now, does this mean that AI gets the green light from me? No, not necessarily. Um, and I do mean advanced AI, not the current AI that's already being implemented in hospitals. I do mean like future AI. There are many more ethical considerations than whether informed consent is jeopardized. That's not the be all end all of whether something is permissible. As I mentioned at the start, there are going to be things like clinician obligations, something else that I'm working on, um, how a system is trained and what biases it learns, um, whether or not it actually takes relevant social, um, economic, et cetera, data and uses it in an appropriate way or if it reinforces stereotypes. There are many significant questions that still need to be addressed before these systems become widespread. My arguments today just go to show one reason why we can't roll the system out. And it's the most often re referenced, um, well, it might not be the most often, bias is probably the most often, but it's the second most, or, or at least up there, um, that a lot of people focus on. And hopefully uh, through my research, we can start to focus on the other questions that don't get as much attention, but are more pressing problems. So in sum, is consent jeopardized by advanced AI systems? 
that will be coming in the future? I strongly think the answer is no. And I welcome your questions about that. Amazing. Thank you so much for that presentation. I really appreciate it and I certainly learned a lot. Um, so I do want to let everyone who is tuning in know that it is, of course, time for questions and discussion via the YouTube chat. So if you aren't logged into YouTube and or if you want to send in a question anonymously, then you can send an email to jcb dot ea at utoronto.ca. I believe that that information may be in the chat um, as well. So you can certainly reference it there. And I know that Jordan is open to hearing any questions and to having a discussion about this fascinating topic. Um, I will start us off just by asking, and I this is all new to me. I am very much not a person who knows a lot about the workings of AI, of course, but in relation to philosophy and personhood, personal identity, I found that part to be fascinating. And I, I'm, I'm not convinced, of course, but I know you didn't go into this, that uh, AI necessarily um, would equate to personhood, that they would have that. I think it depends on a whole bundle of things, the theory of personal identity, the whole bit. But um, the thing I wanted to comment on is one of your responses to the personhood objection. And so I think one of the responses that you outlined, which seems true to me, is that as long as a clinician can actually explain a system in a way that the patient understands, then consent could probably be attained. Um, and it was mentioned that I suppose an AI system could explain itself um, to a patient. And I guess I just wanted to find out a bit more about that understanding piece and how you actually gauge that a person would really understand um, and knowing that that's an important part of informed consent. So I don't know if you can just speak generally about that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's actually a great question that I had originally removed from this because I was afraid I would go too long. Um, in the AI ethics, and especially in the healthcare AI ethics debates, there's a lot of talk about, um, and I will get to understanding, don't worry. There's a lot of talk about explainability. There's explainable AI. We want the system to be explainable and transparent. But explainable and understood are two separate things. Explainable just means that I have spoken something to you. I have written something down and given it to you. Understanding these purposes means that you've internalized it and you can work with it to make it part of your movement forward or your decision making. So when I say understandable in this, in this talk, especially when I get into that sci-fi realm of the computer, the AI saying something in an explainable way, sorry, in an understandable way, I mean in a way that it's not just given to the patient, it's not just given to the client, it's also something that they can understand, I'm using the word in its own definition, I'm gonna backtrack. It's also something that they can interpret with their own values in mind. It's something that is, they're able to combine with what they already know and make sense of. Is that kind of helping clarify what I mean by understand? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's precisely it. And I think that the initial distinction that you made between explainability or something being explained to someone or at someone um, and that real understanding or comprehension. Yes. Yeah, so anyways, your description and that distinction and how you're very, very helpful. Um, there is, I'm just going to the question page. So someone would just like to know if it is possible to share any of the references that are mentioned, um, recognizing that you mentioned a lot of references and names. I don't know what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know what the best way of doing that would be um because <laughs> i do I, I meant to have a reference slide and then i forgot to actually put the reference <laughs> slide in there um it is built i accidentally removed it <laughs> um so I wonder, if, yeah i if, wonder if, um, you could share it with terry or this yeah. person could email you directly maybe and you could yeah. share information either or either or um if i need to i can put my email just let me do that i'll put that back up on the screen here um, great. And I am more than happy. Is it sharing? It is. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I am more than happy to receive 
uh, comments and questions afterwards at both of these emails. Um, I'm more than happy to give my reference lists, everything along those lines. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Thank you so much. Okay. So I'll just leave so, that up there for another like minute or so so people can write it down. I think that would be great. And maybe in the meantime, um, I'll just read a comment and perhaps you can offer a response. So in addition to consent, um, so again, recognizing the focus of your talk, but um, in addition to that as well, AI black box systems are often criticized for possible accountability issues. In light of what in, in light of these, what strengths of black box AI can we highlight to argue for their value in healthcare? So I'm not sure if you want to comment on that. Yeah, so I don't want to go too, too far into that, um, just to stay within the realm of this talk, make, it, make sure it's still relevant. But I think some of the strengths that we can highlight for the black boxes are, um, I mean, the big one is that they have a lot of power. And by that, I mean, they can do a lot of computations. They can synthesize a lot of data that we humans can't do. We, we can't move that fast. We can't make those connections. So it can actually help us learn, help us learn rather than us teaching the machine. Um, and they have, been, they have been said to be reliable because um, from, from um, different trials, different, uh, different tests. I don't wanna say clinical trials because it's not quite right, but different kind of testing zones. It's been found to be pretty accurate. Um, whether or not that's the case, there are people who are, who are going to be challenging that, of course, but I think those are the two main things for black boxes is the power, so the ability to do a lot more than we can do and that supposed accuracy. Now, I don't want to forget the other ones uh, just because the question was about black boxes. Um, so for white boxes, one of the big kind of selling points of those is that full understanding. Sometimes understanding to the point where we get bogged down in the details, but we can understand a lot and make those connections. Um, and a strength of the gray box is the customizability. Because um, when you're thinking in terms of that spectrum rather than in terms of the dichotomy, you can recognize, you know what, I don't actually need to know this, so I don't have to program the system to tell me about it, and things along those lines. I hope that answers that, that question. Lovely, thank you so much. And if people do have follow-ups as well, I should have mentioned, please do feel free to post follow-ups in the chat. And then it might just be a little bit delayed in terms of getting to them because there is a delay between YouTube and Zoom where we're currently um, situated, Jordan and myself. Um, but please do feel free to ask follow-ups. Um, another attendee says, this is great. I, I think your presentation and all of this is so great. Where do you think this will go with consent in clinical research? For example, AI could provide generalizability and reproducibility. Yeah, that's an excellent question. That's kind of something that I want to look into more after I finish with the clinical side, to be completely honest. Um, I think the, the thing that we need to kind of iron out, the more the kind of interesting thing we need to iron out when it comes to research consent is kind of what do we mean by consent in research? Um, so there's a uh, 2019 kind of white paper from the Canadian Radi Radiological Society that I rely on in this research um, that proposes maybe informed consent is the wrong way to do consent when it involves AI. Um, because there are at least, at least three other ways that you can consent to something. Um, so there's explicit consent, which is what informed consent could be considered. Um, there is implicit consent, um, where it's kind of like by, so an example of that one is by driving on the road, you have implicitly consented to a police check. We can debate the ethics of police checks, but that's something that currently you've implicitly um, done. There's opt-out consent, which is all of those newsletters that we all get to our inboxes. Um, and then there is, um, there's another form of consent, which is kind of odd, but they do talk about in this paper, um, which is kind of the kind of, in, of consent where you would be morally wrong not to consent to do so. And the example that 
is used to defend that is organ donation, where it is quote unquote, this is not me, this is from the paper, um, morally wrong not to donate your organs. So you should, it should just be a given that you've consented to that. So I think where AI in research uh, consent kind of combine is more so at, it, it's not so much at the level of what I'm discussing here, it's more so at the level of how, how do we iron out what type of consent we should be looking for? Because that's going to affect how those machines are programmed in the first place. Thank you so much. Okay, and we have five minutes or so, so maybe we'll just ask one more question and sure. then, um, yeah, and, and we'll see. Oh, and there's certainly thank yous coming in. So thank you for everybody, which we'll get to as well. Um, just one question is around biases. And so if AI is developed with certain biases um, ingrained, I suppose, then couldn't this actually influence informed consent? So for example, if an AI system is developed where they think that certain types of people or people with certain conditions can or can't consent in certain ways. So I suppose if human biases are um, perhaps, um, if they become a part of AI systems, and then couldn't this influence informed consent and their ability to interpret it accurately? Um, short answer, absolutely yes. And that's part of why at the beginning of this talk, I said, we can't just rely on the answer that I'm going to come to at the end of this talk as the be all and end all of ethical permissibility of machines. At, at this kind of level of machine. Because absolutely there, and, th and that's one of the big problems in AI ethics, just generally speaking, is how pervasive biases can be. Even when you're working in a multidisciplinary, multicultural team, the data that you're using could be biased um, because of who did the studies or when the studies are from. So even with the best kind of attempts to be unbiased, you might still have bias in your data. So um, that's kind of coming into the obligations a clinician might have, uh, which is another kind of research project I'm working on, um, where I think there's an obligation to some sort of uh, transparency, some sort of understanding, which is kind of why I said this whole thing has this undertone of arguing for the gray boxes. Um, because I think there's an obligation to, um, constantly checking for those biases, constantly seeing what might be filtering in that we don't want to filter in. And then either yourself, or if you're not an, an academic clinician, you're just, just a clinician, getting one of your colleagues who is a, an academic or an academic clinician to do research on how to fix that, do research on how to, how to report that back to the, um, well, identify it and then report it back to the designers of the AI systems to remove that bias. I think there is an obligation that exists there. And the mere fact that bias exists kind of demonstrates that, that obligation. Thank you so much for that. And I don't see any other questions coming in right now, but there have obviously been a number and it's just a minute or so before five. So this has worked out perfectly. Um, though I do realize that there are so many aspects to AI and AI ethics, of course, that could be contemplated and discussed. And I appreciate you weighing in on an incredibly important one. So thank you for that. And um, I just have a couple of announcements to make before we officially thank our speaker. So letting you know that our next seminar will take place next week on Wednesday, February the 2nd. Jennifer Bell will be discussing medical assistance in dying for patients diagnosed with brain cancer, a global perspective with implications for equitable access. To sign up to receive our weekly seminar reminder emails, please do feel free to email jcb.info at utoronto.ca. And CSB students enrolled in the CSB student seminar course, please remember to keep track of your attendance. So on that note, Jordan, thank you so much for your insightful and thought provoking presentation. I know that everyone, including myself, certainly enjoyed it. And um, yeah, and thank you. And we hope to host you again in the future to learn about how your work progresses. Oh, I'd love to come back. And uh, if I could just say, I was serious when I said I encourage emails if anyone has a question that they couldn't think of at the time or if, if you're watching this on YouTube and it's now July, feel free to still reach out. <laughs>
That's lovely. Thank you so much for your welcomeness. I'm sure people will. And to 